Well, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Emma Vinov. I'm going to chair this session. The third one, uh, um, the third session uh, with our uh, coordinators of the EBMS. You're very welcome and uh, thank you to all of you for all your work, uh, doing the coordinating work and keeping everything under control. We are very happy about that. Um, we had already a first meeting uh, uh, with the um, an overview of uh, spring and the EBMS. The second one uh, on the moth and uh, um, a short lecture from Reto about technologies. And now we are concentrating on what we can do in the wider field with all our work. Uh, Aiden is the first one to give a presentation about uh, um, uh, an update of the EU policy because also in Brussels things change and what we can do there with our data. And uh, after that, uh, Simona, Eva and Sue will proceed with experiences and, with the, uh, and also about the implementation of the EU pollinator initiative. So uh, Aidan, uh, uh, may I give the floor to you or may I give the screen to you? Thank you, thank you, Irma. Yes, I'll take the screen. Okay, if you put it in presentation yeah. mode, Let's then uh, it will be perfect. Where's, where's our presentation mode? Um, where is presentation mode? Down, Down the bottom, Aidan, a little, little yeah. bit on the bottom round to the right. Yeah, the oh, sorry. Right, the, it was right, right. yeah so, great. Else, Thank something, you. Something else over the top of it. That's fine. Right. Can everybody see that screen? Yep. Okay. Right. Yes. Um, yes. As Irma said, um, things change in Brussels. Um, policies do change. And there has been a lot of changes happening at the moment. So uh, I'll run through um, what's what's happening and uh, hopefully bring you up to date. I want to start by looking at the, the high level uh, politics, the, the EU Green Deal which started in 2019 at the beginning of this current uh, EU parliament. And it was a whole set of policies designed to tackle climate change and the biodiversity crisis. And it set out a very ambitious long-term vision right out to 2050. Now the European parliament supported the Green Deal, but that support has decreased a little bit over the last year or so due to concerns about the cost of living, about food security, about war in Ukraine, you know, can we afford all these climate change um, changes, et cetera. Um, and this year, there are going to be EU elections in June. And we expect that the new parliament will be rather more populist and right wing. And that new Green Deal policies will continue, but they won't be have they won't have such a high priority. And maybe we won't get any new laws to, to increase environmental protection, um, but we do expect the Green Deal policies to continue because it was a long-term project. As part of the Green Deal, there is the EU biodiversity strategy for 2030, which is a Green Deal policy, and that sets the framework for reversing the decline of biodiversity. Um, the EU has set up a biodiversity platform, which is a, a group of people to provide advice to the Commission on implementation of the biodiversity strategy. And BCE is represented on that by Sue Collins and myself. The um, EU Pollinators uh, Initiative um, was originally published in 2019. And then the a new deal for pollinators was published in January last year as a revision to the pollinators initiative. And it was endorsed very strongly by the European Parliament uh, just in November last year. And the action list for that includes um, the Parliament saying that they want to set up an EU pollinator monitoring scheme, which we've talked about with the spring project that they want to update the red list for butterflies and have a red list for moths and bees and hoverflies. And that work is in progress at the moment. 
and they want to identify key pollinator areas and identify the pollinators typical of protected habitats. So this has been um, one of the themes within the Green Deal for about the last well, four years, um, that they see the decline of pollinators as, as very important. They have set up a number of working groups within the um, pollinator initiative um, and BCE has actually going to be represented on most of those working groups. So there's a national strategies and plans, which is Sue Collins. Pollinators and agriculture is Lars uh, Pettersson from uh, Sweden. Monitoring and indicators, Chris Stansley. Protected areas, Simona Bonelli. And species typical of protected habitats is Dirk. Mace from Belgium. Um, the only group that we're not represented on is the one on pollinators and pesticides because we haven't got anybody with a particular experience of pesticides. But for a, a very small NGO, BC, BCE is, is represented on all of those groups. The things I've talked about so far are the sort of soft policies and strategies. I want to now look at the um, actual legislation that's come through with the Green Deal. And the first one is new legislation on pesticides. So in July 2022, the Commission proposed a new regulation on the sustainable use of pesticides, which would completely replace the Sustainable Pesticides Use Directive from 2009. And they set a target to reduce pesticide use by 50% by 2030. In November last year, the pesticides regulation was rejected by the European Parliament. And in February this year, so only a few weeks ago, as a result of protests from farmers across the EU, the Commission has abandoned the 50% target. In the future, from June onwards, with a new EU Parliament and Commission, we don't know whether they're going to do anything to significantly reduce pesticide use. So, this is definitely uh, still a problem, uh, the, the extensive use of pesticides and the attempt by the Commission to uh, improve the situation with new legislation uh, has failed so far. Rather better news is the new legislation on nature restoration. Again, in June 2022, the Commission proposed the new nature restoration law, the NRL, a regulation which would strengthen the existing habitats and birds directives. And one of the key targets there was to re restore 20% of ecosystems by 2030, which is not very far away. In November 2023, the NRL regulation was approved by the European Parliament. It was a very close vote, and we did a lot of lobbying of MPs to try and make sure that the, it was passed. But it was, but it did scrape through, and it's now expected that it will be adopted by May 2024. Um, we have a revised text. Uh, it might change, but we're, but we and the Commission are both hoping that there won't be any last-minute changes. So what we now have is probably the uh, nature restoration law that we will get in uh, in May 2024. And I just want to cover a few things about this because it's a really significant change and it's probably the biggest change in nature protection legislation in the EU since the Habitat Star and Birds Directive, which was 1992, so a very long time ago. So that's certainly better news that we've got a nature restoration law on its way, but fingers crossed. So we have the uh, if we look at the Nature Restoration Law, uh, Article 8, that requires member states to put measures in place to reverse the decline of pollinators by 2030 and to achieve an increasing trend after 2030. Now, when we look at pollinators as a whole and, in, and changing the trend by 2030, you need to remember that the EBMS is actually the only Europe-wide monitoring system for pollinators. So when it talks about pollinators as a whole, the only way we, that that can be measured at the moment is using the EBMS. As was mentioned on uh, Monday, the Spring Project has developed, sorry, yes, yesterday by Chris Van Sway, the Spring Project has developed a moth monitoring method. And 
we could deliver a moth monitoring scheme very quickly if the EU was willing to provide the funding. And I was in a meeting with the Commission and the other, some of the other NGOs a month ago, and I made the point to the Commission then that uh, we were ready to go, and if they want it, they just need to tell us and they need to pay for it. When we look at the Nature Restoration Law Article 9, that requires member states to put measures in place to enhance biodiversity in agricultural ecosystems. Uh, and this has been one of the real gaps of the current habitats directive that it's protected certain areas um, and done so reasonably well. But the areas that have intensive agriculture have just been uh, turned into the, the green desert and, and really biodiversity has really suffered in agricultural areas. And in this case, um, there is a requirement that they must measure the common farmland bird index for their country. And there's a list in the regulation of all the birds that they have to measure. And the grassland butterfly index is listed as one of the other measures that they can choose to use. So, you know, after lots of work by Sue and Chris and many others, you know, the grassland butterfly index is actually written into the legislation. Uh, which is something I've never seen the like of in any EU regulation before. The Nature Restoration Law Articles 11, 12, 13 and 14 require member states to produce detailed national restoration plans within 24 months, and they will be assessed by the Commission. So this is when it's going to get really quite serious, and each member state is going to have to say what they're going to do. The Commission is preparing guidance on what should be included in those plans, and as soon as we see that guidance, we'll uh, be looking to comment on it. But we have not carried out a power analysis to show how much data is needed in each member state to calculate their national grassland butterfly index. And in this position, we're slightly behind the, uh, the birds monitoring, because the birds monitoring does actually say which birds you need to measure in your country. And there's a complete list for every member state as to which birds they've got to monitor. So that's just a little taste of what's in the nature restoration law. Um, if it's passed, um, I think we'll need to have a, a further discussion about it and bring you up to date with what's happening. Want to move on to talking about future funding for the EBMS. Um, Obviously, since in, from 2018 through to this year, BCE and UK uh, Centre for Ecology and Hydrology have used the EU funded ABLE and SPRING projects to establish 16 new EBMS, the Butterfly Count app and the EBMS database, etc. So we've been reliant on project funding for the best part of six years, and we've made a lot of progress with that funding. But we have no EU funding when the spring project finishes, which is about now. BCE, so what's going to happen from now onwards, BCE will use the last of the spring money to pay Christina to support the EBMS network until at least the end of this year. So we do have some money left over from the project and we are going to use it to keep Christina in post. UKCEH will maintain the Butterfly Count app in the database, but there is no money to pay them for any further developments or improvements. And we are also very conscious that many of the national EBMS coordinators who have been um, recruited and trained as part of ABLE and SPRING will now have to rely on national or regional funding to support their work, and that that national and regional funding is not there in some cases. What we've done about this funding problem is that there is um, an EU funded project called Europa Bond, which is just the, coming to an end uh, about now. And it was set up to report to the Commission on how to organize biodiversity monitoring, including the costs. So the EU were aware that they need to pay for biodiversity monitoring in some way and to set it up. This is for all taxes, not just on land, but also marine monitoring as well. Now, in the last few months, BCE and the European Bird Census Council have um, provided Europa Bond with cost estimates 
for European level coordination of bird and butterfly monitoring. So what we would need to do at the European level to keep to bring all of the information together to support the uh, EBMS coordinators in each country. So we've been working very closely with the uh, the bird monitoring people, uh, which is a first, and they essentially have the same problems that we have. Short term funding. They've made a lot of progress, but the funding isn't guaranteed and they want to move on to having longer term funding from the EU. If the EU wants us all this information from us and they want it to 2030 and beyond, they really need to start paying for it and stop making us spend a lot of our time applying for short term funding. In the case of butterfly monitoring, our estimates are somewhere around the need to have 3.5 staff to maintain the EBMS, which includes the database. Um, we need an extra one member of staff to support NRL implementation and something like 1.5 staff to establish a butterfly monitoring scheme. And the birds people are looking at about the same numbers. They want to need about three to six people um, funded long term to uh, to make the NRL work and to support the bird monitoring. When it comes to member state funding for EBMS, we've had a look at the butterfly monitoring schemes that were established before 2018, so before the ABLE project, to see you know, how were they set up, how did they work, what made, what made them be successful. And the key things that seem to be there as a success criteria are that there was a national coordinator with a permanent job in a university, a research institute, a museum, maybe an NGO, that, that was supportive of butterfly monitoring. So somebody was working on that, they had a permanent job and they would have had the support of their institution. That monitoring was done either by semi-professionals such as national park wardens, and but mostly by expert citizen science volunteers. And in most cases, there's been some additional funding from national or regional governments, but that has often been short term and hasn't been steady and maintained. So we very much recognize that there is a funding problem for many of the BMS that were established under Abel and Spring because the coordinator doesn't have a permanent job and the BMS does not have long-term funding support from the member state. So we're very much conscious that some of you are um, not in a position um, that, that some of these longer term butterfly monitoring schemes are. So that's my update and run through. Time for questions and discussions. And I've put a list of potential things that we might want to talk about split into funding issues and non-funding issues. Um, and I'll hand over to uh, Irma and to Sue uh, to follow through, but I'll put this slide uh, back up if uh, if we want to talk about the, the those issues or uh, we might need to cover some other areas first. So thank you very much for listening and back to you, Irma. Thank you so much, uh, Aidan. This was really a nice uh, overview on um, where we want to go, but also which problems we are going to face. 